Welcome to another episode of the Multiplayers Club. Today it's just myself, Jake and Luke, as Joe had some work commitments so we couldn't make it, unfortunately, so we're holding down the fort today, the three of us. And today we're going to talk about property, how to buy a property in your 20s, should you buy a property in your 20s, how can you even afford a property in your 20s with the rising cost of living and house prices still going through the roof. So let's start off the pod by asking you two some questions as you've both got experience in property, you're both homeowners, you're both property investors as well. So how do you actually go about buying a house in your 20s? That's a good question, Luke, do you want to answer or shall I answer? We can both get an answer, I suppose, can't Yeah, we? let's go over to you first, Jake. Yeah, so, so question, how do you buy a house in your 20s? Yeah, how do you actually go about buying a house in your 20s? For say like a, a normal day-to-day person, Yeah, I mean, like, that, how do you actually at, at do minute, it? That's, that's, it's quite relevant, I suppose, isn't it? Because people are wondering yeah, the, how they actually go about buying it. And like you said, should you actually buy a house? Because the new sort of entrepreneurial culture is rent as well. Mm-hmm. We'll come on to that a little bit later. I'll answer your question. So how do you actually buy a house? So I can just speak from my experience and how we afforded to buy our house. Um, and this is our first house. We bought it, uh, me and my partner, four years ago. And at the time, um, personally, I wanted to get an investment property. So... I was looking at a deal where I could move in, do some work to it. Because they say, like, when you buy a house, it's dead money, which isn't necessarily the right answer. Because, yes, it can be dead money if you're buying... Personally, I think if you're buying a brand new property, I think that's quite dead money because you pay an overinflated price and it'll probably take quite a while for you to actually get the money back. But what we done was... Being entrepreneurial, I wanted to find a place where we could add value. I was going to all the property networking events and researching property online, looking for what's called a motivated seller, which is like a common term used in the industry, and kind of learning how to get those signals. What does it look like? Just what, for the sorry to cut you off for the for the listeners, what is a motivated seller? Somebody who's in a the position where they need to sell, you know, <clears> is pretty much what it says in the tin. But different people have different scenarios, don't they? Some people are like, oh, I, I can move, I cannot move. Like, I want to move, so my house up for sale, mm. but I want this money for it and I, and I need that money for it. If I'm going to get less for it, I'll just stay where I am. Whereas motivated sellers, this guy, for example, the one that we bought off, he his brother needed the money because his daughter has... So basically, his brother owned the house. His daughter had got pregnant. So he's like, right, I need to sell your house now. His brother was living in it. Um, I need to sell your house now because my daughter is pregnant and I need that money to basically buy the property. So eventually, the guy was like, yeah, that's fine, put it up for sale. Now, this guy who lived in the property also worked in a school. So he needed to move out during the six weeks holidays. So there was some form of motivation there. And the guy who owned the property was quite wealthy anyway. So I think give or take 10, 20 grand here and there wasn't really like a big thing for him. <clears throat> Whereas for us at the time, yeah, you know, now, you know, still we thought, yeah, do you know what? We, we're going to try and get a good deal on this. I think it was up for 350,000, offers over 350,000. And we just lowballed it. You know, we just we we were just looking at houses, looking for property that we could get a good deal on because that's what they say you buy your money on your on your purchase not on your sale so we just lowballed it at three hundred and fifteen thousand at the time and yeah it, it got accepted. you took it in there yeah yeah, yeah you, you got it, it at the three one five three one five yeah oh wow so and you then, got it you got it like 35k below below asking price. asking price yeah was it market price i don't think so i think it was slightly overinflated. So. So, so you were in your early 20s four years ago you were 24 i think yeah I was, I was about 20 <clears throat> i was 24 or when we bought the house, 24, 25, yeah. 24. I might have just turned 25, yeah. So pretty much to, to answer your question, a long way, long-winded way of doing it, um, but you have to get a, we had a 10% deposit, which was £31,500. You got to cover stamp duty. At the time, I think we only had to pay £1,000 stamp duty, and that is because on you get first-time buyer stamp duty relief. You got your solicitor searches, they were around about £2,000. You've got, any works you want to do to property, that was obviously what we've done afterwards. Uh, and furniture. Um, so actual cash that we would have needed to buy a property, which is about 315000 
we needed <clears throat> around about, I'd say, just under £40,000. You need to save that up. You know, if, you, if you've got two of you that are on a good wage, you're able to save a £1,000 a month, you know, through from the age of you know, 18, 19, I started to save a little bit. Um, I was earning reasonable money at the time as well. So, you know, if you're putting away sort of £500 a month, it'll take you, you know, a few years to get there. But if you've got two of you that are doing it together, then eventually you'll get there. You know, it's just mm. 1% better every day. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And, and yeah, thanks for that. In terms of your experience as well, Jake, in terms of saving for that deposit, yeah. like I know you mentioned saving a £1,000 a month, etc. So how long, you started saving at 18. Yeah. You bought the house at 24. Yeah. You got it for 315. Yeah. You're selling that house five years later? Selling the house for, yeah, four years, yeah, five years later. And how much are you selling the house for now? Uh, we've just sold it for £385,000. Okay, nice. So you've made, you've made like north of 50k. Yeah, but we property. spent maybe, you know, 25k on it. We've lived there as well. So, yeah, you know, we, we have made, we have made. It's worth more than that as well. It's only because you are it's the motivated buyer. Because you We're now a motivated seller. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, we have become the motivated seller because we found a house that we love that we want to move into and if we don't move quickly we're going to lose it mm -hmm. so we're now if we held out we could probably get another 10k for it but we've chosen not to i can get more than that as well like yeah. on that road it's quite yeah on that road that yeah road. yeah but, oh yeah definitely but we yeah. and the market's shit at the minute so <clears throat> you know again it's a buyer's market now we've become a motivated seller and the house you're moving into I mean, talk a little bit about that because it is a serious gaff, mate. Yeah, nice, serious lovely gaff. house, dream home. Again, that's just from sort of saving, making money off the first property. It's taken us four years to make a good amount of money. Bear in mind, obviously, we bought for 315. We had to put in 30K. We've paid down the mortgage over the last four years. And then we've made done a renovation on it, made a, a good chunk of money on it. So then, yeah, being able to use that to put down a deposit on our, our next property. So yeah, next purchase price, I'll be honest about it, is eight hundred and fifty thousand. And yeah, how you go about affording that is, you know, how we've gone about affording that is we've made money on the first property that we've had. Um so most of pretty much all of the equity is going into the next property. Um if you go over a mortgage, I think, of seven hundred thousand, which we are, you have to put down a fifteen percent deposit. You can't put down a 10% deposit. It has to be 15. So what is that? About 80? No, 120 something. 120K. Yeah, and you're using the equity from the first house yeah. to put into the second. Yeah, put into the second house. It's not actually costing us a penny more to move. Wow. In that sense. But the actual cost of moving, stamp duty is £30,000. Mm -hmm. It's going to cost us much money on solicitors, solicitors sale fees, solicitors purchasing fees. Obviously, we did. We got a lot, of, lot of work to do to the house as well. So, yeah, we've basically made money from the first property. Move on to the next one, and obviously, your salary has to be higher to be able to be lent that amount. So, um, back to your question about how you afford to actually purchase the property is you look at how much <coughs> the, the a lender will give you for some. Some give you four times, some give you five times. It's not financial advice, by the way. But some give you four times your annual salary and some will give you five times your annual salary. Mm -hmm. So if you want to say, let's just give you an example, £500,000, you would, as a couple, you would need to be earning £100,000 in order to be able to uh, purchase a, a property for £500,000. Nice. So and for the, a, for the viewers, more, that, that would be together 100k so if you're both earning 50k or one's yeah. earning 70k the other's earning 30k uh, that's fine that's, that's yeah, your if you're buying together yeah obviously if you're buying on your own then you've got to have 100k yourself uh-huh uh-huh so it's five times multiplier say so some banks look at you differently yeah so yeah, dif yeah, different sure. have different criterias um so it sounds like buying property for you has been worthwhile beneficial yeah 100 percent. and i know we spoke about it earlier and about the actual should you buy a property you know we bought a property for investment purposes. Although people say it's a, the worst investment you can ever make is in your own property. Mm. I've got a different look on it because actually properties that I'm buying to live in Ooh. are ones that we're going to renovate, add value, make money. It's, yes, it does cost us money to live there, but we're going to spend money. You have to spend money to live somewhere anyway. So why not do it on your house? Why not do it up? When you sell the property, you don't have to pay any capital gains tax on it. If you bought a property in the limited company, buy it, flip it, you then have to pay capital gains tax on the profit that you've made. 
when we're making money from the property that we've now sold, we don't have to pay anything on it because it's privately owned. You can only do that obviously on one property. You can only live in one property at a time. Of course. So yeah, Luke. Yeah, Luke. So obviously, I know you've got some experience in property as well. You bought your first property younger than most. How many properties you own? Two. Well, that two I've properties. Got a let with my pal, and then I've uh-huh. got the my house I live in. Yeah. Nice. Cool. So, what what's your experience been with property? Talk us through your property journey so far. I think when I finished school, I always wanted a property. Like, I don't know, it's just one of those things like, yeah, I want to get a property, like, property ASAP. So I always had it in my mind, I want to get one as soon as I could afford it. But realistically, it's still hard to get it on your own. So luckily, I had a friend at the time and we just saved up. And then as soon as we were ready, went half. So we actually had to live there for a little bit. So we got a residential mortgage because it's 10%. So the property was around 270, something like that. Put down 10% mortgage. And then... 27K when, between yeah. you. Yeah, and then when you've lived there for a certain amount of time, uh, six months, you can actually apply for a, um, a consent to let with certain providers, and we were with Nationwide at the time. So we just wrote a letter to Nationwide saying, um, we actually don't want to live there anymore. We want to we want to move out. So can we let the property? And I actually didn't yeah, know this as a thing until maybe just before we were getting the property. Like Some people never heard of that, right? Spit out a form, and literally three days later, they came back, yeah, all good, no problem. So moved out, rented out straight away. Um, yeah, it's a good way to get on the property ladder straight away. Nice. And then, how much a month were you making from that property? So, at that time, the mortgage was around like eight hundred pound, and we were running out for like thirteen hundred, roughly. Plus a few maintenance and stuff like that. I yeah, there wasn't like too much to do really. Like really even well. now, I've had it for like how many years? I don't know how many years. Eight, or eight years maybe. But I haven't done anything to it really, other than like randomly, like a roof tile will fall off or something. But Couple and quid. within those um within those eight years, so you bought the property for how much? Eight years. Yeah, on, so how I much bought it for now? um, we bought it for around I think it was two six five or two sixty, and then so what happened is after the two years, right? Because we're on a residential mortgage with permission to let it out, suddenly the rate goes really high because they put you on the I don't know what rate we're on like one percent or something ridiculous, and then as soon as you finish your term, like two year term. They put you on the what's it called the rate that's higher. You know, like when you finished your agreement. Variable. Yeah, they put a variable rate, and it was like triple what it was. So it's because you're not locked into a deal. Yeah. You have to lock in. That's when they say like, oh, do you want to do a two year or a five year? When your two or five year ends, automatically you get put on the shit yeah. deal. A bit like energy. Yeah. Like we've had it with British Gas, haven't we? With yeah. Sam Brighton. <clears throat> so they put us on put us on a rubbish deal, and the problem was because. They couldn't, we couldn't fix it because like, oh, you, but you don't live there anymore. So we can't fix you on a residential mortgage because you don't live there anymore. You need to go on a buy to let mortgage. Yeah. And they don't do buy to let mortgages. So we were like, okay, cool. What do we do? So luckily the property had gone up in that time um, to 300K, which is like 30 So it went up 40K. Yeah. Well, around 35K. Yeah, How many up, years? Two years. In two years. Wow. Technically, I don't actually think it had gone up by 300K, right? I think it had gone up by a little bit less than that. But what happened is, because we were kind of remortgaged into another provider, which I can't remember, maybe Santander, they will come around and value it. And we said, look, we need 300 for this. It's, it's worth 300. And to be honest with you, I don't think they really cared that much about saying it's worth 300. What's the difference between two, two, 290 and 300? We own the property. We put down a 25% deposit because it had gone up 30K. So we put that into the property now. So now we actually had an uh, official buy to let because we had 10% and now we had 25%. So yeah, that, it worked out well. And then that, at that point, we put it on an interest only mortgage, which is 300 pound, right? So 300 quid, running out of 1300. So technically 1,000 profit a month split between two couple of bills and stuff that was good so it was, good. it was all good until like a, a year rates. ago a year ago because we didn't fix him for long enough because i don't think you don't know what you don't know but looking back at it now and you're getting one percent like you should just fix that for ages and as long as possible but. i feel like we as as a generation like when we when we were, we were buying property as well you don't realise at the time, you think 1%. You don't know whether that's high or low. We've never actually experienced high interest rates. So we just thought that was normal. Yeah, yeah, I remember yeah. getting mine and just being like, oh, I just want two years because I'm, I'll, I want to do it up and sell it. And then it gets to the end of the two years. You're like, oh, I'll fix it for another two years. Whereas because we've never experienced four or five, you know, our parents have experienced like 15% mm-hmm. interest rates. We've never experienced that. So it's kind of like, oh, I'm saying, oh, that's just normal. It'll never go up. It's always going to be that. Now we look at it and think, fuck, we should definitely... <coughs> so now the rate that has gone up from £300 a month, right? 
and now the now the mortgage is one thousand two hundred ninety nine pound and forty pence. And I rent so out. For, I make it round for thirteen hundred. So we make sixty p, <laughs> and we rent out and we split it between us. We get thirty, <laughs> no, you don't. We get thirty p each. <laughs> It's banging, mate. mate I that's a get cola bottle now. right there. <laughs> yes, yeah, one Fredo a month. Call it, yeah. So it's like it's one of those things because yeah, it's what it is. It's our fault. Our fault. We didn't fix it, and we're gonna have to put could, the rent. You up. can put the rent up though, right? Yeah, yeah. Because we didn't put the rent up because like Tenet's we didn't need to. And she's been there for ages. Family, nurse, and that. But obviously, we we pull it up. I think we pull it up like about fifty quid now. We probably need to pull it up again. Um, but it's difficult. That's why I think it's crazy because I think our mortgage has gone up a thousand pound, right? So a thousand pound, like luckily we're running out for that much. So we're not losing money. We're not really making money, but it is what it is. But some people are going to have to, I can imagine some landlords would have gone, nah, I need 1.6K now. That person would have been like, oh, I can't, I can't afford that. Now, where does she go? She's got a downsize into a, what? She's got a family. A one into bed, a one bed. And that's enough. I understand that to have like a mad knock on effect. Yeah, just for clarity on that. So I look at the rental markets every single week. South Croydon, your flat is, right? It's yeah, two bed. Yeah. So two bed flat, South Croydon, you're looking between, I'd say, like 1500 on a good deal, up to 1800 1900 2000 for a you slightly better the market spec. market pretty well. Yeah. yeah, like especially South Croydon because it's commutable. <coughs> Excuse me, Purley as well. I mean, how, how, how much was your studio in Purley? I mean, I was renting a studio flat in Purley. This was two years ago. I was living in a studio flat. It was eight fifty a month then. Oh, that's nice. That's not even that bad. To it, be fair. it wasn't that bad. This was, it was a nice flat. It was small. It's a studio flat. It had a bed that you literally pull down put yeah. back up but it was modern it was it right opposite well Purley yeah, station lovely, yeah. with, with bills it was it came to about 1100 pound a month i think um but like that flat now i mean two years later the market's changed massively like because when i was living in a studio flat obviously i was aspiring to move into a two-bed flat and the two beds at the time you could get a decent two-bed for about 1250 1300 around Purley. But now you look at Pearly, right move, two bed apartments. Yeah, you, you, so some are going for two thousand a month for an okay ish flat. You know, it's crazy, crazy. You can get ones for like fifteen, sixteen hundred, but that older. I think, like uh, Luke said, that's because of the interest rates. Sort of oh, absolutely, up, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. So the rent's going to go up. I think just back to your point about um, the landlord not making money. That's yeah. That obviously has a knock on effect with the rent. However, landlords will still make money on the property price long term so a lot of landlords i think maybe forget that not that i'm a landlord but just looking at it from an outsider's point of view is that yeah that's what i'm having for about selling it because i'm still making money like i'm still yeah because i'm at the end of the day the property price has gone up like it was yeah. 300 and it was still four continue. years ago it was so now it's got to, be. to go up yeah exactly. it still how, how much do you feel the property would be worth now so you bought it originally for 260 two yeah. years later it was valued at 300 yeah. and that you know six years from then today yeah, i reckon so i reckon the 300 is probably inflated by maybe like 10k uh-huh. but let's say it was 290 and um when we were looking recently i think maybe like 325 something like that so it's still like still making like another 20k on it really mm. so even if i run out and don't make any money then it's, it's not the end of the world. Absolutely. So just moving on to a slightly different question, staying on the same topic. Um, for day-to-day, you know, people that are working hard in, say, cap salary jobs, that's the majority of people, unless you're, you know, a business owner or in sales, um, you know, how do people actually go about being able to afford a house in their 20s? Because it's tough out there right now. I know? think, like, we... From a young age, I was still earning good money. Sort of, 40, I started earning forty. I think we talked about it last week. Forty k from twenty nineteen twenty, and then it went up from that. But I think, like, if I was sort of still around that mark, I think it's just managing your money as well. It's hard to say because I've never been in that situation, and it's circumstantial. There's people that have to rent because you know they they don't get on with their family and they need to move out, so they have to rent. So I think it's just maybe suffering a little bit on your living standards and just being, know what you spend. There's so many people like my missus, she like we go through her subscriptions and it's like, do you know how much you're spending on this? You've got this subscription for Pret and you don't even, you haven't worked in London for the last year and that's costing you 30 quid a month. That's 300 pound a year that you can save. You've got, this subscription, you're paying this much to do this every single month, which you don't really, you don't need to do that often. So I think it's really knowing your numbers and it's kind of like running your life like a business. I've always done it. I've always had, right, these are my fixed outgoing costs. Same in business. 
and this is how much I pay for my mortgage, how much I pay for the subscription for the TV, the Sky, and just knowing literally what you have left over and just being super strict on what you have left over, <coughs> putting it to one side and just not overspending. Yeah, no, I agree. I think it's so common people say, I don't know where my money goes every single month. Like, I earn decent money, I don't know where my money goes. I used to be that guy two, three years ago. I was absolutely that guy. And then I think even you said to me, like, your your bank statements will tell you, like, where your money's yeah. going. Like, you're, it's, you know, it's, it's there on your, on your app. So yeah. I remember I was paying subscriptions to, like, certain charities that I signed up to when I was 18. And it was, like, little things, like seven ninety nine 99 a month. I had, like, two Amazon Prime accounts. It worked out to be an extra, like, 300 quid of stuff that I just didn't even need. Yeah. I cancelled that a few years ago straight away. Um, you, you know, I feel like if when you're earning small amounts or average amounts, if you're good with the numbers, then you're going to be good with the numbers when you start earning more money. Because there's people that I know that earn probably 10 grand a month and they, they don't, they live month to month, you know, just because they don't manage it right. Whereas I know other people that might not earn that much, but they're frugal, you know, they might be on like 32k a year, which is a, a, like an average salary, uh, but they save percentages every single month, you know. And I think personally how you actually go about affording a house in your 20s is, you know, I can only speak from my experience. I was that guy who I had a bit of a dysfunctional kind of early 20s period. I was always out partying. So it was quite hostile when I was living at home. Um, I moved out because I was clashing with my stepdad and my mom and my sister. So from the age of like 22, 23, I was renting. And I kind of fell into that rent trap where I did start living month to month. Um, earning okay money sometimes, but if I was earning 3K, I was spending 4K before you knew it, I racked up uh, like quite a few thousand pound in debt on my Amex and other credit cards. So when I got to the age of 25, after a few years of renting, I decided to move back home, right? Not the 26, I moved back home with my mum and um, wiped off all of my debt and started kind of going back to basics, looking at my finances and saving every single month because when you rent in your early 20s and I'm sure a couple of viewers listening to this are probably in that situation and I was there uh, it's really hard to save you know if you move out too quickly and a lot of people are forced to they might not always have the choice uh, but if you do have the opportunity I feel like if you can stay at home for as long as possible just to save up that money you know in two three years worth of discipline you'll have a house deposit um, I'm in a situation where three years ago I didn't have a pot to piss in but people probably thought I was doing all right. Like I had a nice car, a good watch, but it was all on finance. I was in a lot of debt. You know, moving back home gave me the opportunity to wipe off that debt. And now I do, I could buy a house. If I wanted to, I could get a, I could get a house deposit. You know? And you're, I know, like we've had loads of conversations. You're a fact where you're like, do I buy or yeah. do I rent? You know, mm. what's, what's your opinion on that now? Yeah, I'm, I'm still trying to work it out. Like I've got mixed views on it. Like there's a side to me that wants to have a home for me and my, my partner eventually to, you know, like have a family, to have somewhere what's always yours. But then there's another side to me running an online business. I love to travel. I'm always overseas. Do I want to be tied down to one location? You know, do I want to pay 5.5% interest rates? You know, I've done the numbers on Rightmove for a 400k property which might get you a two bed around here um slap down a 40k deposit right say 10k worth of renovations that's 50 stamp duty what's that a couple couple grand yeah say like all in 55k and then for that 400k property i'm going to be paying 2.2k a month on a on a mortgage right but then i could keep that stack in the bank i could rent a gaff for say 1500 or even if i want to live Below my means, I could get a one bed for twelve fifty a month, which is technically nearly half the price of renting, but I've still got the stack in the bank. I now have options, right? If I want to go to Bali for three months, I can just hand in my notice. After six months, I can leave, you know? Um, so my views are, I think it depends the situation you're in as an individual. Like if you want to be in the UK always and you want that security, maybe buying a house is the best option for you. From your boy's experience, it's treated you well. I'm sure it will with other people. But for me, I'm like, I don't know where I even want to be right now. You know, is it Dubai? Is it Bali? Is it, is it Spain? I don't know. So I th I'm, I'm sitting tight for the meanwhile. I'll probably rent for a couple of years before I actually buy. And then I also think like when I do buy, I want it to be a place I like. I don't want to settle for something that I don't like. I don't want to have to move again. Yeah. Precisely. And, and what 400K can buy you in today's market 
it's nothing great around here as well. Yeah, like you could always rent out though, couldn't you? If you let's say okay, you got bought a house and then you I don't know you want to go live somewhere else or whatever, you could rent out for a year. I thought else. about that as well. That's an option. But then I think the headache that comes with that, like you hear so often of landlords saying, I've got this tenant that just hasn't paid. You know, the, the law, from what I understand, favours the tenant opposed to the landlords. I swear you can't even kick them out for like six months if yeah. they decide not but to it's pay It's like, them. I do think it's a minority of stories. Sorry. You're going to hear about the bad and stories. You can't, you can't actually yeah. get insurances against your tenants not paying the rent. Well, what, what would be insurance. like your boy's views on it? Because... You know, say, for example, if there's some listeners in a similar situation to me, they might have a house deposit in the bank. They don't know whether they should buy a rent. They might be an entrepreneur. Is it a case of should you keep building that money monthly, stay disciplined with it so you've got more options? Or do you think maybe buying a property is Luke's a great a good example. Option? Like, we all agree having money in the bank is just rotting away. Like, put that money to good use. Get a little bit of risk. Like, Luke's a great example as to what he's done. He purchased his first ever property as an investment property, and he's been able to make money from it. So he didn't... And I looked, and I li- lived with, obviously, my missus' parents. For yeah, like, you weren't even living at home. Yeah, because I think you might as well. I think how much money you can save, like, you're an example of it. You can save two, three thousand pounds a month. Most of your money that you earn, you can save if you live at home. Mm. But I think, obviously, there's some kind of pressure where people feel like they need to live... They need to move out at earlier than maybe they can afford to or for whatever reason. When if you can save up the money, then you're going to get a better house the longer you can leave it. It's definitely circumstantial. but Yeah, the more you start earning, the older you get, <coughs> generally, you know, year on year, you should really try and be earning more money. Mm-hmm. So which means you can afford a bigger house if, you know, if that's what you want. You know, people, people might not want a bigger house, but... You know, if, if that's what you want and, you know, you go from earning 50K and then you get a new, you know, you get more experience, get a new job and all of a sudden you're earning 100K and your partner's earning 40K, you can then start to, I can't do the maths. Yeah, the first day, house will be sick, though, yeah. You just get it'll be a banging decent house. first house, yeah, bang. Yeah, a nice house. And then, so then it'll be a decent first house, you know, you get stamp duty relief for first-time buyers on that as well, so that'll probably save you a few quid as well mm. if you're going over that mark, so... Yeah, it's circumstantial. The thing is, like, would you buy? It's like, if would you would I recommend someone buy or would someone rent now? It's hard because, was, yeah, buying's expensive, but so is renting now because renting's kind of gone up. Mm. Yeah, oh, the rents mortgage, are crazy because the mortgage so. rates. So it's like, if you want to move out, then and you've got the money, then I probably would get put a house deposit on if you're going to live there. You can buy somewhere nice that you can do up that, that you can do up a little bit that you can make money on. Then you But that's that's why I done it. Like I didn't choose to move out. Like it was that was more circumstantial as well, not because of me, but because of my partner. And we were just like, right, let's you know, let's let's move out then, you know. And I was like, look, I, you know, I'm happy to move out, but I don't want to waste my money just on buying a nice house and sort of living in it. Like, cause that is a liability rather than an asset, and you know that's what that's what they say, isn't it? Yeah, let's let's talk about that a little bit, cause I've got some interesting stats here. So I'm gonna give you a renting stat firstly. So that um, the average room in London to rent, this is a room, right? And you yes. ask us the question. Should we guess? Oh, yeah, 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 I was. That was. So oh, God, here's sorry. a here's a quick it. fire question: uh, What is the average price to rent a room in London? Is that just a room in a house? A room in a house. In a HMO, yeah. A bed sit, HMO. <coughs> Average. Yeah. I mean, I know they probably start from around about 600 quid, but they can I was going to say like average is I say nine? 750. 900? Okay. So you're saying 900, you're saying 750. Yeah. There's not a single room available in London to rent on right move for less than £1,000 a month Fucking in 2024. One, one room? A room, yeah, that's how crazy this the has got to be gone. central. Central, yeah. Right. So it's saying it's saying London specifically. I'll, I'm gonna put the article on the edit here because yeah. whenever we put these clips on TikTok, when they do get a lot of views, you always get loads of Gary saying, Oh, no, that's not right. I want to see the stats. We're gonna put the stats on the screen so you guys can actually see this article, which is interesting. So, renting aside, let's talk about the average house prices in the UK. So, the average house price in the UK is 280,000 pounds. Right, the average house price in London is five hundred and two thousand pounds. The average price in Southeast London is four hundred and eighty thousand pounds. 
right? So I think you touched on briefly how much you need to be earning to buy a property, but just shed a yeah, bit more light a, on, um, on that. We've done a quick maths on it. So let's just say, so let's say, for example, what did you say the average was? 400 and... In South East London. Let's say South East London, where we are. South yeah. East London, the average property price is £480,000. So how much do you actually need to be so earning to buy a, a property? £480,000, you've got to put down a, a 10%... Uh, deposits you've got to put down forty eight thousand pounds which leaves you a mortgage of four hundred and thirty two thousand pounds most lenders will give either a four or five multiplier let's do four and a half and do, okay let's go in the middle do four and a half so between you as a couple you need to be earning ninety six thousand pounds per year somewhere like that's 50k each 50k each yeah and then you need what did we say forty eight thousand pounds to actually Mm. Put a deposit down, plus your legals, plus your stamp duty, plus furniture. So you're going to need around about 60k to get the average house. Right. Okay. So after working out those stats, here's the problem, right? And this is why there's so much negativity and depression, in my opinion, within you know men and women in their twenties. Is the average salary is like 30 grand a year. You know, a lot of people are on 25 grand That's a year, take 27 home, grand a year. pounds a month, isn't yeah, it? You know, so if, if you need to buy an average house in South East London, a salary of about 50K a year each, what 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 do, what do those guys do, which is the majority? Which, you know, I three years ago, that was that was me. You know, I, I, I was not earning much money at all, right? So it's like a lot of people feel lost. They, they might still be living at home, they might be renting, and they're just like, what the fuck? How, how am I ever going to be able to afford an average home. Learn you know? learn a skill and get really good at it. Really good at it. Because then that's when you can actually start to see the benefits. Uh -huh. Moving up in your company, obviously you can start off with doing you know, whatever. I started off doing cleaning windows. I was a window cleaner. Then I got actually really good at that. Yeah, but then I'm Window licking, in it? Yeah, yeah, and then I started licking. I got fired. <laughs> um, and then... Then I moved on to floor fit in this manual. I was terrible at that. I was fucking hated. I couldn't hold a hammer properly, like upside down. So I weren't very good at that. So I moved on to something else. I studied electrics at college. Weren't very good at that. But I knew I was good at talking people. You got me a job in the brokerage. Mm. I was okay at it. I weren't bad at it, but it taught you a better mindset. Then you just move on. It's evolution. You move on to things. And then I found something I was really good at, which was selling holidays and company trips and corporate trips. So... Then I found my niche. Then I just fucking worked really hard and got good at it and started making good money. Same as you. You know, I could point that question back to you. How would you do it? Yeah, I think for me, it was a slow burner. Like, I got into sales. <clears throat> I got into sales when I was 17, 18 years old. But I had no financial literacy. So when I was 18, and this was like 10 years ago, there was a couple months where I nicked three grand to take home. And at 18, when you're only outgoing is paying your mum 200 quid a month. I think my mum was even paying my phone bill when I was like 17, 18. I was balling, mate. Yeah, mate, I remember, Absolutely you, I remember, balling you, out. I remember you being in the office and you just went out and bought Russell. Jim took me for dinner. And <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah, we made it. <laughs> Felt like I made it off my three Gs. But at the same time, you know, I was also on like a £500 a month basic or whatever it was, £1,000 a month. And um, more often than not, I was taking home less than a grand a month for two, three years of my life. Um, you, you know, I, I, I learned sales some months I had, I'd done really well, but if I earned four, I'd spend five, you know, if I earned five, I'd spend six. Um, I needed to learn actually how to manage money. And that's just something that you're not taught, especially if you're from like a working class background, you're grown up where money's not even really discussed or spoken about. It was always kind of an awkward subject to talk about in my household. Uh, so I just didn't know, you know, first credit card I got, I thought it was free money. <coughs> Obviously, subconsciously, you think that. Of course, it's not. Um, but I think personally, like the skill I learned sales, it, it took me 10 years to become really good at it. You know, it took me 12 years to start earning good amounts of money. So I think learn a skill, but just don't give up on that skill, even if it doesn't pay straight away. You know, uh, everyone's got different timelines. Like some people, they'll go into sales in the first year, they'll make 100K. Second year, they make 300K. You hear it all the time by the gurus on Instagram. I, I wouldn't always take that as gospel. It can yeah. happen. Some people can go in and just smash it. Do you know what I mean? Oh, absolutely. Like, and we know people who have absolutely smashed it. Like for me, it took 10 years of working every day at a skill to start earning serious dough. What, what you would know? you say to that question? People that are on the average salary, how would they afford the average house? 
Well, definitely try and go in with someone if you can, for sure. Like if you've got missing. So that's that what helps. we're saying, right? Like the average the average house requires you to have fifty thousand pounds each per year, pretty much. Yeah. But then the average salary is thirty two thousand pounds per mm. year. <clears throat> I guess you've got to make a decision. Like some people I know they got they bought a flat. They've got a flat which is cheaper and then after a few years and they're earning more money, they've now the flat's gone up a little bit and they now got the deposit for a house and then they've moved into a house so they've kind of just done it that way so that's definitely an option so they pretty much they've made money off property yeah but and, the then, problem and is their salary's gone up higher which would help inevitably your salary should go up if it's not going up then you probably should get another job i think just to add as well like if you can just throw away your fucking credit cards because those things are dangerous. Like depends who you are, though. Because like depends, you, yeah. credit card actually helps you get a mortgage because it shows that you can borrow money. And if and you're financially literate, yeah. absolutely. Like for the majority of people, like speaking from experience, I was not financially literate whatsoever. And the thing is, you you don't realize how much debt can actually creep up, especially if you're renting and you've got a certain amount of outgoings every single month. Your mates are going out, like, you're like, all right, fuck it, I'll just put it on a plastic, put it on a credit card. And then it's 100 quid here, 50 quid there, 100 quid there for a new pair of trainers. At the end of the month, like, I was checking my statement, I was like, fuck, I've done, like, two grand on my fucking Amex this month. You know, it, it, it creeps up, but then you can only afford to pay 500 off. And then the next month, it's like the cycle kind of repeats. And I know of people that have got themselves in, like, 20, 30 grand worth of debt wow. on, on credit cards. And that's more common than you'd realise, Right, like you know, I love my mum to bits. I hope she won't mind me saying, you know, she wasn't earning loads of money when my mum and dad separated. She had like thirty G's on credit cards just from like day to day expenses. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, like, where possible, if you can, like, just go easy on a credit card. It depends. Like at, at the minute, like, I'll be honest, I've racked up a decent credit card size bill, but it's not because. I don't have the money. It's because I'm actually using the bank's money to make money. Yes. So rather, if I, if obviously, we've got the business. If you take yourself to the over the higher threshold, you pay thirty three <coughs> to thirty three point seven five percent if you're a higher rate taxpayer. Mm -hmm. So for me to invest that money into something, say stock shares or crypto, whatever, I'd have to take the money out. I'd then have to pay thirty three point seven five percent. Then invest it, and then if I did make money on it, depends on how much you make. I'd have to pay twenty percent tax on it. So I'd have been taxed 50% from the money in my company. Mm. So instead what I've done is I've got a bank card where I pay 0% interest for the next 18 months. I've just basically used that money, invested that money in 18 months. I'll pay it back. I'm left with the <coughs> profit that I've made on top. Yeah. So like that, that you what, have to use the money wisely. Use the credit cards. Oh, 100%. Wisely. Like, you know, the, the, strategy, the strategy you just said is massively beneficial for credit cards. Like, how I use credit cards now is very different to how I was using it three, four years ago, right? So, like, my message is more so just to people who maybe don't even want to invest. They're just trying to save for a house. Like, maybe don't buy that pair of trainers on a credit you card. You need credit rating, though. You True. do need a credit rating. So, my partner's little brother at the minute, I mean, he can't even get, like, a mobile phone contract because having... No credit is worse than having bad credit. Mm. So what they what we said is get. I think the bank that does it might be. I think it's Capital Bank. My that's my first ever credit card. Two hundred pounds that they gave me. I weren't I, again. I weren't able to get a, a phone um, contract on it, but they gave me two hundred quid, and then you start spending on it. Pay it off in full at the end of the month, and then eventually they'll message you and increase your limit. Then you can get your phone contract. And then slowly you can build. Pause the podcast there to give a massive shout out to our sponsor, the Manifestation app by Robert Heisey, the UK's number one unconscious mind therapist. Now this app is an absolute must for anyone that's looking for further success in their life. It covers a whole range of things from meditations, calm stories, unconscious mind therapy, journaling, mood tracking, affirmations, the list goes on. It's an incredible app. It's got an incredible community within the app that you can connect with other like-minded people. And we actually have a code TMC manifest for 25% off of your first month. So go check it out. It's on the app store, the manifestation app. Back to the podcast. Don't you find it interesting that to buy a house, 
you need credit. And to get credit, you have to get yourself <coughs> into debt. Simon Squibb speaks about this. He uh, came back from traveling. I can't remember the exact Hong story. Kong. Hong Kong. Internet. He had like, I think he sold a business or something. He had like seven figures in the bank, but he had no debt. So he was like, can I get a mortgage, please? They're like, nah, sorry, you need a credit rating. Okay, well, how do I get one of those? I've got seven figures in the bank. You need to get into debt. He's like, what? He's like, I'm clearly financially literate. I've got seven figures in the bank. Oh, and he's right. like, so you're telling me I've got to get a credit card, what I don't need because I've got cash to get into debt so I can get a mortgage. So I feel like the whole kind of system within itself is kind of contradictory in terms of how you would get financially literate. It's like you have to get credit cards, which is good if you're disciplined. Luke, you've always been great with credit cards. Jake, you've always been pretty good with credit cards. I'm good with credit cards now because I've learned the hard way. But it's like it's a very slippery slope. Yeah, when I was at Metrorank, a lot of people would come in and they want to, they want to try and get a mortgage or get a loan or whatever. But because they've never had any, they, can't, they haven't proved that they can pay back loans or credit cards before. So it's like the system just says, oh, no, you're not eligible. So mm. it's like a catch-22 kind of chicken before chicken or egg situation. Yeah. What do you do? I think a lot of the time if you go to your actual bank and you have been all right with money, then your actual bank will give you your credit card. Like... Depends how old you are, but you can definitely get one. You've got the capital option. There's another one called Aqua, but we would know if someone's come in with Metrobank and they've got an Aqua credit card, we know they're real bad with money. <laughs> we really? just know because it's like anyone, actually, can get, anyone can get it. I used to have one of those. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. A long time ago. The difference is where in like where you were doing, doing broken, like they would... Ha they would make you spend your money because if you spend yeah. your money, then you need to come back and earn more money next month. They did that. They, they drilled it into you. It's cam it, in the long run does, does bits for you. But what, what was that story about that guy who got made to buy a trip to the Maldives? Oh, okay. Yeah. So a, a friend of mine, he, um, he was selling wine and he was doing okay, but it was on the come up. He had a girlfriend at the time. And one of his goals was to go to the Maldives. And obviously in broken, it's commission only, right? You get a percentage of what you bill. And um, then his boss at the time, I won't say names, basically said, I'll tell you what, I'm going to put a deposit down for the trip in the Maldives in your name, right? The holiday was like seven bags. Uh, you need to bill 100K this month. You know, you'll get your 10% commission and you earn 10K. And this is at the beginning of the month. He's like, all right, yeah, cool, let's do it. He's like, fuck it, let's do it. So he put a deposit down for the Maldives holiday had to come up with seven grand by the end of the month, right? Um, or he's got to tell his missus, sorry, babe, we're not going to the Maldives now. And that month, literally, he was like punching walls, mad stress, but he was working 12, 15 hour days. And he built like 120 Gs, he paid off the seven G trip to the Maldives and he went to the Maldives. So fair play, like it, it worked. But this is where I think I was kind of set up to be financially illiterate. I wouldn't say to fail because it's made me who I am. In the broken industry, I, I was actually, like Luke said, encouraged to spend my money. I was on like a 700 pound a month basic and um, my boss made me finance a Rolex when I was 18. I was 18 years old flossing with a Rolex date just. It made you. In a way, like it kind psychologically. of- Psychologically. Psychologically. It's not like you have to do this or you're fired. It's like, if you want to be the best version of yourself, you know, and you want to be the man, you need a Rolex. And you need to go and buy that £250 pen because no one, no pens. one's allowed in without the Mont Blanc pen. You need to buy a Mont Blanc pen. You, you, you know, need loafers, like best. Tailored <laughs> suits, Russell and Bromley loafers, Baluti loafers, Mont Blanc belts. Like, you, mate, I was 18. I must have looked like a baller. I didn't have a pot to piss in, lads. <laughs> I was just spending all my dough on clothes because that's kind of what they, they made you do. And, and the psychology behind it is they used to say if your outgoings are higher, you have to earn the money which is kind of true, but at the same time, I just wouldn't advise that now I've matured. I'm, I'm very different with how I look at things now, but I've realized in business, if we've got like a 30 grand VAT bill due at the end of the month, it's that feeling of having to earn money, which really just <coughs> like really gets me going now. And I'll be on the phones like I was in Broken thinking, I ain't got a choice, I've got to make 30 Gs, you know? Yeah. Like, have you noticed that? Whenever we're under pressure, I actually do bare new business. Yeah, it's yeah. good to have the, I think, it, yeah, it's because you feel like you need to, to a certain extent. It's good so. to have the PTSD to a certain extent. <laughs> from the yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, here's a question, right, going back to property. So interest rates are at 5.5% right now. I think last year they were slightly higher, right? With interest rates so high, is it even worth actually buying a house right now? Or would you advise waiting it out? Because it was only a few years ago, the interest rates, like you were saying, were 1% or 2%. What are your boys' takes on that? They're definitely all going back to 1%. Like, I've probably ever slashed a lot of years. I just don't see it happening. It's, 
I, I, personally, I just I don't even pay attention really to. I do pay attention to what's going on, but I feel like the right time to buy was last year, and the time before that it would have been the year before that, and the time before that it would have been the year before that. So, for me personally, <coughs> again, we as at given our age, we've never experienced a property crash. Yes, there was the property crash in 2008, but we were never on the receiving end of it because we lived with our parents. Mm. So we never actually knew what the property crash was like. So same with interest rates. We never knew interest rates to be as high as they are now. So when they were 1%, we didn't know. Somebody who's a little bit older who had seen the property crash in 2008 might turn around and be like, do you know what? I would buy, I would weigh it out because X, Y, Z, you know, and they've experienced it. They've got trauma. They've got fear. But for us, well, we've never experienced it. For me, I'll just buy now. Yeah, because <clears throat> if it goes down, if the mortgage rates go down, then you're Probably just going to you're just going to go into a new mortgage anyway. Yeah, it's not going to be fixed for too long. Oh, two years. Yeah. We're we're being fixed into a. It's not, it's like, it's not years, massive it? more in it, like it is, but it's like, it's, it's it is low more. It's, it's, it's oh, between it's, one and five percent, <laughs> but I mean, realistically, we're only going to go down to three percent. So if you're going to buy a house, like I said, buy it, just buy it now because you might wait two years when I was two percent. And the good thing is, in the way that I view it, with the one that we're buying, we have saved an awful lot of money because the interest rates are so high. People don't want to buy that house. That house last year was worth a lot more than what it is now, as was my house. So because of that, we can now afford a better house for less money yeah, because the property it, yeah. price has come down. So yes, we're paying X amount more per month on the interest, but actually we've probably saved maybe 50 to 75K on the new purchase price. I've got to say, like for me, someone that could that get a property. Very enthusiastic. <laughs> yeah, interesting. <laughs> no, no, it's, it's, it's genuinely it is an interesting take i've got to say like my view on it is the majority of people i know that have properties right especially the older generation that tell me oh you've got to buy a property it's great like everyone who's telling me this is broke man like <laughs> like i don't even want to listen to you lot. like you guys know 100 percent. I, I take on your feedback but it's like you know people know like in my family i'm not going to say names that i could get a property right but i don't want to be like you I don't like that's not how I want to live my life and the way I see it is you know I could put this say 40 50 G's on a property then I'm back on zero in terms of cash flow then I'm living month to month and it's like rebuilding that pot again or another view I have is because I'm in a fortunate position now where I can save a good amount every month my money's growing the same way a property would grow anyway but in terms of it's like a higher volume probably of the percentage I'd make on my money just from stacking whilst I'm trying to work out the next best option, because here's what I've also worked out. With interest rates at 5.5%, if you get a 450K house, this is approximately, everyone who knows me knows I'm not a mathematician, but you're paying double that price for the price of the actual property. I get the property goes up in terms of percentage wise, but if you want to say live a happy family life, oh, I'm going to live in this property for 25 years, I'm going to pay my mortgage off, you're, you're, you're paying off like you're not paying off 450 G's you're paying off like double that basically it's yeah, like right? that anyway it's though it's like that anyway it's, it, it's it. always going to be like and that, that's that's the scenario where people say like oh you know get get a mortgage and pay your mortgage off as quickly as you can I think that is totally the wrong answer yeah I'm putting mine as I'm going to be eyeballed up in debt for the foreseeable and hopefully for the rest of my life I'm going to be in large amounts of debt on my property Mm. because there's no point me piling money in to the property because I've already got the property the property is going to go up by 10 10% 20% 30 over the next sort of five six seven years that property is going up in price anyway what is the point in me paying off more of my mortgage I'm not earning any more off of it I'm, I'm earning the money of the, what's what the property price is going up by regardless I'm still going to make that money cool here's a, here's a question on that actually. and that's just going back to your point sorry mm. You said that you pay double the amount over that period, uh -huh. over 25 years. It's going to be worth double that in 25 years anyway. Do you think, here's just on that, right? This is what I find interesting because I've, I've listened to a couple of property guys on this. And look, I'm not an expert, but I want to ask your guys' take on this, right? 
in the early 2000s, property, there was a time where it, it was increasing 20% annually. It was crazy. It was amazing for landlords. You know, Lee, our camera guy, he had property around that time. We were still kids. He was like 35 years old, something like that. And it, it, was, it was great back then. But then if you look at the appreciation prices now, it's nowhere near what it was. Here's another, like the, the question, is, what I'm getting at, the question is this, right? The gap between average salary and average house price is growing further and further apart to where for the majority of people, lads, we're, we're fortunate. The majority of people can't afford to buy a property in our 20s, right? With, with it just getting bigger and bigger, how sustainable is that? Because there's going to come a time where, you know, mortgage lenders and people just won't be able to afford to buy a house. So is it going to be double that? Is it sustainable that property is going to continuously grow when less and less people can actually afford to buy the properties? Property, What's your boys' take Property on that? prices have to increase. Why? Because it's just basic economics, which I'm probably going to get wrong, but basic economics is the government is in national debt and it's always in national debt, right? So therefore, we have to have inflation. What that does, inflation brings the national debt cost down, right? So your pound, the, the pound worth of debt five years ago was more than what it is today. The pound now is less. So they have to have inflation. So that means things go up in price. So therefore, the cost of goods go up, the cost of your car go up, and the cost of your property goes up. So things have to move in order to shrink the national debt. So in terms of inflation, this is interesting as well, right? Because if your property price is rising because of inflation, then in theory, are you really making that much money on the property because of the inflation raise? Well, leverage, yes. You know, your property is worth 500000 You've only put 50 k in. So if it goes up by 10%, you've made 50 k right? But actually, you've only put in 50 k So you've actually made 100%. You've invested 50k, your property price has gone up by 10%. Mm. You've made 100% of your money. Nice. Yeah, that's viable. So, yeah. So, and that, is, so property is is the right way to go. Yeah. Yeah, it makes sense. Okay. I don't think you can go sense. wrong. Like, you might not make, it's not fast money, it's not quick money, but over a, a period of time, I doubt that you'd lose money unless something was wrong with the property. Do you know what I mean? And, and most people now, if you're, you're clever it. about property, I mean, some people go, buy new builds, again, don't think that's wise at all, but it is what it is. But if you get a property, you know you can do it up a little bit, spend 20K on it while you live there for a couple of years, do it up and then sell it. Most of the time, you're pr probably going to have to make money on it as well. And it can move <coughs> into a bigger place. Like some people probably just do that. I bet people have done that the whole life, 20 years, just moved every five years and upgrade, upgrade, upgrade and always live in a nice house. O on the new build thing, right? I want to get your guys' take on this. I think it's an interesting subject because I've got a couple of friends that have bought new builds. Nice flats, right? Expensive. New builds, to buy or not to buy? And if no, why? I don't know an awful lot about new builds, so my opinion's probably not correct. But from uh, from what I do know is that a lot of they've got the um, help to buy scheme, which is on new builds only, as far as I'm aware. I don't yeah. know anything else. So help to buy scheme means you can put down a lower deposit, which I believe is five percent. So you don't actually have to have the ten percent. You can just put down five percent. And the equity in the property, when you actually do come to sell, I don't think you can sell within a certain time frame. But when you do come to sell, I believe that a lot of the equity that you would have earned in the property has to go to back to the government. First of all, you pay an overinflated price anyway because you're paying a premium for something that's brand new. And it's probably for the market to actually reach the rate that you would have paid, it's probably going to take a good five years. So you probably wouldn't have earned any equity in the five years. Any equity you do have goes back to the government anyway. If they use a scheme. If they use, if, if you use a scheme, yeah. You don't have to use the scheme to get the new build property. But same again, I, I believe, and again, I'm not, I don't, I'm not an expert, but I believe you do pay a premium for getting something that's fresh out of the wrapper. And I think with it, if you're buying a... Um one thing people got to be careful with with like a new build flat a lot of the time like the people that 
that own that land, they charge mad service charges. Like you're paying rent alone to have. What's it called? What's it actually called? Is it service? I think it's charge? called a service charge. They, yeah, they pay service charge. Ground rent. Oh, that's it, yeah, that's it. Service charge. But they, they charge ridiculous amounts. So a lot of people are getting bumped. Like I, I was reading an article um, yesterday, and someone can't. There's a, someone that can't even sell their flat because the service charge is so much that no one will buy it. So they're just trapped in it. But I think if you've got enough money to buy a new build flat or a new build house, then you could literally buy somewhere that's a bit older for the same amount of money and be bigger. And it'll people and you've don't got more like to doing do it, it though. There. People don't like the stress. Like I was speaking to someone who was looking at new builds. I was like, well, yeah, same again, same scenario. You've got the money. Why don't you just like, oh, they just want what's called turnkey. Just want to be able to go in, turn the key and live. Like people don't think like we think. Not everybody thinks the same way. You know, they look at it as an investment opportunity or they feel like they're getting somewhere. Then you might as well buy, couldn't you just buy a new build money. that was a new build five years ago, so it's still newish. Does that still count as a new build? Well, but I mean, it's like... Brand new second hand. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, it's like, it's a couple years old, so it's... so it's You're better, still better off doing that. But the problem is, even then, a new build that's five years old, it's still like... It's not you can't do anything to make it go up. Yeah, so exactly. Yeah, but it w- inflation will pull it, put them up. Yeah. I think it's just the fact of like, yeah, cool. You buy it for four hundred k. If you want to sell it the same day after living it for a couple of weeks, let's say it's not going to be worth the same. Yeah, amount there's of money, nothing. Yeah. You can, well, other than adding extension and maybe a loft conversion, yeah. those kind of things are going to add value. But the price that it costs to do that sometimes doesn't actually add the value onto the property. For sure, for sure. This is going back a little bit, this question, but I think it's a good question. I want to get your guys' take on it, right? So uh, renting, it's becoming almost kind of fashionable for entrepreneurs to rent, cash flow, etc. However, you know, it's deemed by society in the eyes of society to be a waste of money. Older although, society. Older society, although it does, it tends to have some benefits renting as well. I mean, what, what, what are your guys' take on this? Yeah, again, it comes down to circumstance, really, and what, what you want. And, for example, I wanted to, I saved up another deposit, and I wanted to move out, like, with my missus, because we've been living at hers for however long, like, eight years. Like, it's just time of my life, like, didn't want to, and I didn't want to rent, because I, I kind of don't like the fact that I'm paying someone else's mortgage. I'd rather just pay my mortgage. <laughs> That's my personal opinion, isn't it? It's a valid point, for sure. What, what, what's your take on that, Jake? Because I know I, there was a time you were actually thinking... Yeah, I tried to convince my partner to sell so we can then start actually buying property to make money, yeah. Because that's it, like, we've got a lot of money that's tied up in the house because we bought it, we done it up, and we made money. So what you can do, sell it, use that. we now got a, a good, sizable sum to then be able to go and maybe buy maybe two or three rental properties. And if two or three rental properties are bringing in what you originally had at the time, yeah. which was a thousand pound a month, if you're making three thousand pound a month from the properties from your say hundred hundred and fifty k, but your rent is costing you fifteen hundred pound a month, you're fifteen hundred pound a month better off. Could be paying your rent. One good thing about renting, hundred percent. Yeah, you, the you fact have that to you pay your rent where you're living. Yeah. Yeah. One good thing is that you don't have to actually. If anything goes wrong, your landlord has to sort out. Do you know what I mean? Like my boiler broke the other day. There's no, I had to pay two grand to get a new boiler. Really? Like had damp on the wall. That's costing a couple of grand. Had to fix something on the roof. That was a couple of grand. It cost like 800 quid just for the scaffolding to get on the roof. Like all that stuff would, if that, if I was renting the same house, that my landlord would have paid that. Maintenance. Yeah. So maintenance, if you just move into a house, everything goes wrong. It's sorted. Kind of so like leasing a car or owning a car, isn't it? It's the same. Sure. It's the same scenario, but yeah, it's it's all circumstantial, isn't it? I think it's going to be what you do with your money, in my opinion. So if you're going to rent, that's calm, but make sure that money that you're saving, you're not just putting in the bank because you're gonna it's gonna lose money because of inflation. So if you're renting because you want to use your money to go and make more money, that makes sense. If you're not going to use that money and you're just going to save, some people just save for the sake of it, literally have no plans of spending that money, just want more money in the bank, you might as well just have that in your house and pay your mortgage. That yeah, makes, definitely makes more point. sense. I, th- I think you're both right, and I don't think there's a right or wrong answer. I think, it's like you said, it's very subjective depending on the individual. The, the bigwigs like Grant Cardone, 
Like he's a multi billionaire. He doesn't he rents where he lives and he always is a massive advocate for mm. that. Yeah, for sure. I think it's I kind of touched on this earlier. Like if you're the type of guy or girl that wants location freedom and you're a digital nomad, I probably wouldn't advise buying. If you don't want any tie downs, you want to travel. Like there's certain places you can rent in Vietnam and Thailand for five hundred pounds a month and live like a king. If you can make money from a laptop, you can rent there. You can rent there and you're gonna live a very nice life. And you could probably come back to the UK in five, ten years, buy a place outright if you really wanted to, although I know you boys probably wouldn't advise that anyway. Um, so yeah, I think it's subjective based on the individual. I don't think people should get into the the mindset of which I was kind of getting geared towards as well. Everyone around you is doing something, so you feel like you have to do it. You, you just have to do what's right for you. Like I was chatting to two of my friends at a party on Saturday. They both just bought gaffs. And I'm there like, fuck, I should buy a house. Should I buy a house? All of my mates are buying houses now. And then I thought to myself, no, I need to remember what, what my mission is. And until I'm 100% certain of what that looks like, I'm not going to rush into a decision because of what everybody else is doing. So I think, you know, if anyone's listening to this, just make sure you do what's right for you and not what everyone and else is You can is always doing. change though, you know what I mean? If you, let's say yeah, you do go and rent for a year, then you can still go and buy a house afterwards. If you buy a house and you decide, oh, you know what, I've been living here for years, I've spent all this money, I don't like this anymore, you can sell it and go yeah. and rent. So you're never stuck forever. Yeah, vice versa. Like, yeah. Vice versa as well. Like, you know, if you rent, try and make sure renting is an option. Like, it's just what you'd prefer to do as opposed to, you know, not being able to buy. Like, if you can save a house deposit and then decide to rent, you told me this, then you're renting out of choice, not out of necessity. And that's a nice feeling to have, you know, knowing that if you wanted to, you could buy a house. It, you know, if you want to try a couple of different areas, maybe you could rent for a year. You might want to live in Manchester for six months, Liverpool for three months, London. Try and find what's right for you. And when you find what's right for you, maybe buy there. If you're looking for a family home or if you're looking to invest, obviously, it's very, very different, as you boys know. It doesn't really matter where it is as long as it makes money, you know. So, yeah. So, I mean, everything we discussed today is definitely not financial advice. And we've said it a lot. Yeah. It's definitely up to your particular circumstances and situation. These are our opinions. Yeah. Know, and it's yeah. on our opinions based on what we've all been through. And we've all got different opinions on it, really. So um, I hope it gives food for thought, you know. Yeah, hope it's an enjoyable listen and thanks for listening. Thanks for tuning in. See you next time.